Welcome to worship at Westminster. We are glad that you're here with us this Sunday morning as we seek to worship God with gladness and with gratitude every Sunday here at Westminster. A few announcements I want to let you know about. First is just a reminder that we do have uh, friendship pads near the center aisle, and we ask that you sign that, pass it back down, and let us know that you're here this morning worshiping with us. Uh, and if you're visiting with us today, if you go back out through these center doors, just to, let's turn around this way, your right, uh, there's a table with gift bags for visitors. So we hope that if you're visiting with us, you'll grab one of those to help you know a little bit more about our church family. Uh, an important announcement to make is that next Sunday after worship, so about 1030, we will have our congregational meeting. We have two a year. This one has several purposes. I know it's in your bulletin, but it's also that we need to announce it formally. Um, but next Sunday after worship, we will elect our officers. We have great slates of deacons and elders, and those folks will be elected that time. We'll also hear a report of the Westminster Corporation. That's their annual report. And then lastly, we will make three very exciting bylaw changes. I'm being a little sarcastic, but the bylaw changes are important, uh, even though sometimes we tend to not think of them as important. Uh, it's important for how we live our lives as a church family. Last week, I made an announcement about Prairie Readers and our own Pat Leach sharing. Uh, she's the director of Lincoln Public Libraries and a member here at the church. That is actually this Wednesday. We had a correction last week. I just wanted to be very clear about that this week, and there's more information in the vine in your bulletin. Also on Wednesday, a new event that is also a traditional event that I want you to take note of. That will be our pie and fellowship time. So if you're a pie baker or uh, can get to Hy-Vee quick enough, you're invited to bring a pie with you. Uh, Wednesday night at 545, we'll gather downstairs and have a meal together uh, and it's a time of fellowship. And there is information on how to sign up for that in the bulletin. Lastly, I want to say a special word that today is our first Sunday with our, our uh, bell choir back here in the service, and we want to say thanks to those of you who have been gathering on Wednesday nights. If you're interested in joining that group, uh, they meet at 5.30, and you can get in touch with Laura, and we do want to recognize uh, and say thanks for Laura Ross being here today and leading us in that way as we seek to worship God with gladness in all the phases of our worship service, so thank you. And now we will shift our hearts and minds to worship God with gladness. Stand in body or spirit as we bring our hearts and minds to the worship of God. Let our hearts exult in the Lord. Our strength is exalted in God. Let our mouths ever be fixed in praise. God has given us the victory. There is no holy one like the Lord. There is no rock like our God. Praise the Lord.
When we experience God's grace, our lives are changed. When we experience God's grace, we have see how we have fallen short. We ha- we're in seeking God's grace, let us pray silently and then together as one voice. Let's pray. Together we pray, God, who is faithful and just, we have failed to help those who have little while we have so much. We are faithful not and fail to appreciate the gifts you have given. Our prayer, let us away righteously. Forgive us, merciful God, and lead us to a humble path by your spirit. We renew our strength each day. No matter how we face the hope in your grace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, Jesus Christ gave himself once and for all, forgives and saves. Therefore, be reconciled in one another, holding fast to the confession of our hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. Believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. And now as we shift toward a moment of passing the peace, we invite our children who'd like to come forward for our children's time or down to head this way. Uh, Pastor Jimmy will be sharing that time together, but we invite you as a church family to pass the peace in ways that are appropriate for you And let us say together, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. kids. How you doing today? Well, I'm not Trish, but she's, she's there to lead you down to Faith Village in a minute. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to, rather than sit down there, because with my arthritis, it's hard to get back up. <laughs> but I think I'll, I'll sit here so I can look right at you, and I hope you can hear me. I am mic'd. Okay, good. Well, in Faith Village, you're going to be talking about a special set of rules called the Ten Commandments. You've probably heard of the Ten Commandments before, right? And these are rules that God gave the Israelites through Moses at Mount Sinai many, many years ago, uh, thousands of years ago. And they still guide the lives of of Jews and Christians today. The Ten Commandments. Now, how many fingers do you have? Ten. Ten. And if, here's a mathematical question. If we split ten in half, how many are in each half? Five. Five. So you would think that if if there were a, a, a set of rules for how we deal with our relationship or our or what we do and say with God, and what we do and say with other people, there would be five each, right? But that's not not the way they're split. It's split four and six. And God was very modest. God only had four rules for what we do and say with God. Have no other gods. Don't make things to worship, like a statue, okay? 
Don't misuse God's name. And keep one day out of seven for God. It's called the Sabbath. Keep one day out of seven for God. Now the other six rules have to do with what we do with each other. Okay? They're very important. And the first is, well, actually, I would guess it, it, it'd be the fifth rule, but the first of the other six is honor your father and your mother. That's important, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's pretty important. And here's a really important one. Don't kill people. We're not supposed to do that. So we have, we have rules all over the world against taking someone's life. That's very important. And then there's a rule that we shouldn't steal what belongs to somebody else. And then there's a rule that we should be loyal to the people in our household. Okay? Especially a husband or a wife. And someday you may have one of those when you get older. But be loyal. Okay? And then don't lie about your neighbors. Isn't that pretty important? Don't tell lies. It, it hurts other people if you tell things that aren't true about them. And then the last one is the hardest of all. It really is really, really hard. Because if you see somebody that has something really nice, like, a, say, a bike that's newer and fancier than your bike, do sometimes you kind of want that bike instead of yours? And you get jealous of their bike? Mm. That's called coveting or greed. And we're not supposed to want things that, that we don't have like that. We're supposed, we're supposed to be happy with what we've already got, if we can be. Okay? So those are the, the Ten Commandments. And remember, there are four for what we do and say with God, and six for what we do and say with each other. Very important. Okay? Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for these rules for our lives. Help us to remember that they are not suggestions, they are rules. In Christ's name, amen. Have a great week and go to Faith Village. As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed together, let us pray. Holy Spirit, give us a vision through encounter with your word. A vision that shows the new thing God will do and the work that God is doing in our lives and in this world today. Spirit, give us a vision so that we may be shaped and inspired to be a part of your work and your new thing, too. In Christ, we know grace. And so in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our two lessons this morning come from the lectionary, that cycle of text that we use often throughout the year. First is Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus... By the new and living way that he had opened for us through the curtain, and there's a parenthesis, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in faithful penitence and in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised us is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, 
not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And as the more you see the day approaching. Our second scripture is more of the focus scripture for our sermon today, and that comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him, privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now turning out of the temple and turning their backs to the treasury that was outside the temple, Jesus and his disciples step out into the dusty streets of Jerusalem. In the preceding few years of ministry, Jesus and his disciples spent most of their time in small towns dotting the coastlines of the Sea of Galilee. Comparatively speaking, Jerusalem is the big time. You know, there's even an old parable from the first century about that city that you might have heard before. It says, what happens in Jerusalem stays in Jerusalem. Okay, that's Las Vegas, and please don't take that as a serious comment. That's the 20th century, but you get the picture. It helps us understand. So the disciples are amazed. And one of the disciples says, Teacher, look at these big buildings, these large stones holding them up. You know, the factor of the matter is that as humans, when we see something new and impressive, sometimes we've just got to express our amazement or our excitement. But then Jesus does what sometimes Jesus does and turns the curiosity of the disciples on its head with some intense and unexpected imagery. He warns that those big stones will be thrown down. And then he goes on to talk about earthquakes and wars and violence, with a warning to beware of false teachers. All these things, Jesus says, are the beginning of the birth pangs. Yikes. Now we're talking. No wonder so many Christians wonder about what we often nowadays call the apocalypse, the end times. But here's where I want us to dig deeper into what's really happening Now, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these movies, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, or Ferris Bueller's Day Off, or even Goodfellas. But in those movies, there's an interesting screenwriting practice that takes place. It's called Breaking the Fourth Wall, if you've ever heard of that. Breaking the Fourth Wall is when a character in a play or a movie or a TV show seemingly stops the acting, and talks to the audience at home. Zach, a lead character on the 80s TV show Saved by the Bell, would do this timeout thing that you see in sports most often. He would do the timeout hand signal, and the action of the other characters would stop in its tracks. And then in order to break the fourth wall, he would talk to the audience about his latest scheme he was cooking up. So rather than going on and on about just the surface layer of the passage, I began to wonder, what might it look like if the star character, Jesus, broke the fourth wall? Or even the narrator, Mark, who 
was to break the fourth wall and help us see some deeper meaning. So first, we do need to consider the surface level, the action and the plain speech of Jesus. That plain speech at the end, when he's with his closest disciples, is provocative. It's difficult. It's even troubling to our ears when we start to think about the images, the stones of the temple and the stones of the large, image, of the large buildings are going to be toppled. Now, this leads to quite a bit of misinterpretation when folks today take it as a sign of the end times for our own generation. And I would say that's a no-no. So we need to hear the characters break the fourth wall to see a little better for ourselves. Now, if Jesus were to break the fourth wall, I could imagine him saying, Hey, folks, listening out there at Westminster 2,000-ish years later, you should know I was speaking during the week of my arrest in Jerusalem. This wasn't a quick trip to the city to hit the nice stores because we didn't have those. The disciples and I came to Jerusalem with a purpose. We entered the temple, but before we did, I overturned the tables of the money changers. I went back and forth with the religious leaders sparring over issues, and later that week, they responded by arresting me, having the Roman authorities convict me of treason. And then they subjected me to the harshest form of Roman capital punishment, crucifixion. I'm pretty sure when I said these stones will be thrown down, the religious leaders and the Romans heard it, and that's all they needed to know when the rumors got back to them. I was already on what you Nebraskans call thin ice. In breaking the fourth wall, Jesus might go on to say, get this. I wasn't speaking about an actual physical destruction of the temple by my folks in my own time. One popular interpretation in your day is that I was preparing my disciples for my likely and eventual death and resurrection that very week. Not to mention the fear, the persecution, and the turmoil that would follow in their lives after I was resurrected and ascended to God. Frankly, these folks needed some hope to keep sharing the message of God's kingdom after I was no longer with them. Now, we also might have to consider the perspective of the writer, the narrator of the stories that we hear talking about Jesus in this gospel, Mark. So with what we know about Mark from history and scholars and linguists, let's briefly hear what, in my imagination, Mark might say when breaking the fourth wall for us. Hi, I'm Mark. So with what we know, I want you to be clear about something first. Get this, I was not one of the original 12 disciples. I know that's a popular theory, but that doesn't mean that my words are not important. In fact, I was the first person to record the stories of Jesus in one volume. So I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> in my day, we were beginning to see that the end times were really Maybe just the beginning, because now we were getting into the second and the third generation of Christians, not just those who met our Lord firsthand. We're talking kids and grandkids now. So I wrote down the stories of Jesus shortly after the Jewish-Roman War. Have you heard about that one? That's when the Roman authorities destroyed the Jewish temple in the year 70. I bet you thought those two groups were always in cahoots because of the stories you heard about Jesus' last week, but that wasn't the case. Well, there was a lot of tension over the years, depending on who was the emperor or who was in charge in Jerusalem. Anyhow, when I wrote these stories down, I wanted my church family back then, those first and second and third generation Christians, to know that the world was not falling apart. The challenges that we were seeing were not the end. If anything, we could realize that God's kingdom was continuing to break in, into the world despite the times that seemed chaotic and uncertain to us. 
Okay, we're cutting back the fourth wall again here and going back to the sermon. This is me speaking now, and that's right. Mark was sharing the words of Jesus not long after the temple had fallen at the hand of the Roman Empire. You can see how these two images line up. So Mark is not only a recorder of Jesus' life, writing it down, but also an interpreter of Jesus' life. And all the gospel writers were interpreters of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, at least a few decades after it all took place. So Mark was sharing these words at a time that there were plenty of rumors of war, plenty of violence by the Roman Empire, plenty of uncertainty about the future. So after Jesus warns of rumors of wars and the call to beware, but also not to be alarmed, the passage ends with this line. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Now, I grew up knowing this passage because I didn't know it very well, but knowing it as words that would be pointing to an escalation of terrible events that would lead to the end of the world. But I think Jesus saw his own life in ministry as being the one who brings the kingdom near, the kingdom of God, into the world in a new way. He even said he came to do just that, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to give sight to the, cap to the blind and freedom to captives and to bring new life. Then maybe my old perspective was just a little bit skewed. But the beginning of the birth pangs point toward the reality of experiencing difficulty in that community that needs some interpretation. Because the end result is not and was not destruction. It's new life. The end result is not just everything crumbling down, it's birth. The end result is not just persecution, it's promise. Ultimately, it is God as mother bringing a new thing in the kingdom into the world. And so Jesus' disciples are not to be afraid. Instead, they are to be engaged in bringing about this new thing. Michael Stipe of the Athens, Georgia native band REM once sang, that's great. It starts with an earthquake, birds and snakes and aeroplanes. And he goes on and speeds up before getting to the chorus that says, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. That song is a perfect 1980s Gen X shrug of the shoulders at calamity, but perhaps it's also a shrug of the shoulders at those doomsday preachers on TV who get so much popularity. In Mark 13, what we often call the end times, it's really just the beginning. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. The uncertainty and fear that surrounded the disciples in Rome at the time was not the end. 2,000 years later, we see that it was reality of the days that they were in and that God's work did not stop. Today, we face our own questions about the days we're in with intense social divisions made even more intense by social media over the pandemic and racial justice and women's rights, you name it, it's divided these days. And as I talk with pastors, my colleagues in town, and friends around the country, we recognize that our own questions in these days are similar, simply because of the reality of the days we're living in. But as we wrestle with questions about divisions and what is next and what do our churches look like today, we begin to navigate sometimes to our own fears. But in those moments, maybe myself and my colleagues need to look toward Mark's church family. And we can see God's work did not stop. God was still doing a new thing, and God is still doing a new thing today like the gospel writer Mark, or Catherine of Alexandria, we'll talk about her story another time, or Martin Luther, or Martin Luther King Jr., or Bernice King today. We live in the times in which we live. 
But Christians across the generations have heard and followed God's call to take part in the new thing God is doing, to take part in God's work. And so, too, we are called to take part. Whether that's rolling up our sleeves in a mission project or donating to grow our children and youth program or giving thanks to God each week in the sanctuary, our showing solidarity for righteous calls for justice in our city. Yes, we are invited, we are called, and even sent to take part in the new thing God is doing and will do. So friends, what some call the end times are really just the beginning. So the question we should be asking as we leave this space today is how will I take part in God's new thing? How will Westminster take part is a question we're already asking with session and vision folks. And the cool part, my friends, is that we don't know all the answers. We all come up with them together. But as we near 96 years as a church family this next month at Sheridan and South, and as we look toward 100 years of that same reality in 2026, I want you to be dreaming. I want us to be dreaming of what can be and what may be and what will be. So be aware that as we dream of how we might encourage one another toward love and good deeds, to borrow the words of that Hebrews passage, we can look around right now as we hear children laughing in Faith Village and see worshipers of different generations here in the sanctuary. And we celebrate deliveries of food and of hand-knit goods and scarves to People City Mission. And we look back to this spring and remember the table we sat out on Sheridan the day of the marathon and handed out water together. We hear music ministries blossoming and we are finding spaces to share our dreams together. The good news is those things are happening. God's new thing is ongoing. God's work does not stop, and it is happening among us right now. So Westminster, let's dream big of what God can do. Dream big of what might be, because each day is a new beginning, and each day brings us the possibility of being part of God's own dream, to take part in God's own work for good in this world. It's just the beginning, and I feel fine. To God be the glory. Amen.
With Christians of many denominations across the world, we share two ecumenical creeds, the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is most often referred to as the Baptismal Creed, the basic creed of individual faith. And I would invite you to stand, if you are able, or in spirit, if not, as we say what we believe. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And today's moment of gratitude as we weekly seek to say words of thanksgiving for things going on in the life of the church or for those folks who gathered yesterday here at the church. If you parked out in our parking lot, maybe some of you walked, but if you parked out in our parking lot, you saw how great it looks out there today. All the leaves are up after a very uh, fall, fall the last couple weeks. Um, but it looks great out there. So thanks to all of you who participated, all of you who brought your tools and different things and spent some time out there getting us looking uh, fresh and clean out in the parking lot. So thank you. And as we give thanks for the good gifts of God and the lives of our, our church family, let us pray. Merciful God, we give you thanks for the beauty of the space that you give us at Westminster. Whether that be the space of the sanctuary with our ornate glass windows and our beautiful wood, whether that be the outside as we look at the front on Sheridan Street or as we pull up to the back and see that tower with a cross. We ask that you help us to be good stewards of this space that we have been at for nearly 96 years now. We ask that you help us to do what we can to let it be a space for the generations to come but also remind us that this space is one part of our lives of faith and that we are called as we go to be your people in all places. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are always building up. We bow our heads today because we are the, you are the God of sunrises. You are the God of apple pies and hand-knit sweaters. You are the God of children's laughter and shared cup of teas. You are the God of what is useful and what is beautiful, so we bow our heads with gratitude. Today, we come to you hungry to build each other up. We give thanks for the ways that you see, we, the ways we see things happening already. We give thanks for the greeters that welcome us into this space, for friends that encourage our faith, and for Sunday school teachers that show up week after week. We give thanks for the grandparents and parents that brought us to this church, for the friends that walked the long, hard nights with us, and for this community, which always points us to love. However, not everything we do builds each other up. We know this better, you know this better than us, Lord. We have pockets packed with bigotry. We have hands full of assumptions. We have ears crowded with distractions. We have arms clinging to scarcity. We are holding on to much more than what is useful for building up. So help us put it all down. Give us the wisdom to pick up and carry only what is good, only what is heartfelt. You are the God that builds up. We long to build with you. So with hope in our hearts, we follow your lead, beginning with the prayer your son Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This week, as we recognize that it's not the end of the world as we know it, it's the beginning of the opportunities in our lives as Christians and the continuation of those opportunities, ask the question, how can I take part? And so many of you, as we shared in the sermon and in our moment of gratitude each week, are taking part in so many great ways. But a new year is coming, so dream big. Let us dream big together and dream big one-on-one. -on -one. Let us dream big in ways that inspire us to be God's people in the year to come. So friends, as you go from this place, may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you, build you up, whether we're in these beautiful, within these beautiful walls or sent out into the world wherever we go. Know that God is with you. Amen. Amen.